it's Sharon Kelly from the Berwick Public Library. This year will go down in the history books as one to remember for sure, as the pandemic is at the center of it all. It's sometimes hard to think about 2020 in any other light, but there are a few positive things that make this particular year an important one to remember as well. The first is the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage, and the second is the 200th anniversary of Maine statehood. But our next guest, David Ramsey, will present a wonderful program that looks back into our state's history and highlights three notable women of Maine who had an important and influential place in our history. They've marked our hearts and minds and those of people from around the world, not only here in Maine. In the summer, David works in Portsmouth, New Hampshire as a tour guide narrating historical local history on the Thomas Layton for the Portsmouth Harbor in Isla Shoals. He also is a guide for Historic New England at the Sarah Warren Jewett House in South Berwick. As always, we'd like to thank the Berwick Community TV for making this possible for us to bring these wonderful programs out to you. Please welcome David Ramsey. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm David Ramsey, and I'm very excited to present three notable women of Maine, Kate Furbish, Margaret Chase Smith, and Rachel Carson. So let us begin. Let's talk about Kate Furbish. She was a amateur botanist, and she made quite a reputation for herself, having discovered a unique plant in far northern Maine. Kate was born to Benjamin and Mary Lane Furbish in Exeter in 1834, and the family moved the next year to Brunswick. During a constantly moving life, they would spend nearly a century, 97 years, and during which she would forge a reputation as a field botanist and unrivaled painter of Maine's extensive flora, it was to Brunswick that she would always return. Brunswick of the 1830s was booming. Population 4,000 had an air of industry, cultural ferment, including Bowdoin College, cotton mills, 400 dwellings, two banks, seven stagecoaches arrived daily. Father Benjamin, although somewhat weakened by childhood scarlet fever, was successful in his business. He had his own hardware store and he was the inventor of cast iron stoves. He had a strong personality which seemed to have been passed on to his daughter. He read much, had clear judgment, and was active in civic affairs. One of, his five, of the five sons born to the Furbishes, three survived childhood, John, Edward, and Frank, and then there was just one girl, and that was Kate. It was a very close-knit Victorian family. Brunswick at the time had a very active cultural life, Theater, music concerts, public lectures were the most attended, and it was very much a church-going community. Benjamin, her father, was a Congregationalist. Social and cultural ideas were in the air, mingling with the heady optimism of expanding commercial activity that characterized Maine in the decades following statehood in 1820. Interestingly, the campaign against excessive drinking of spirits the demon rum, seemed to have originated in Brunswick, and Maine was the first state to ban the sale of alcohol in 1851. Brunswick even played a larger role in the abolition of slavery, and Bowdoin College was the center of the movement. Not all residents were on board. Harriet Beecher Stowe, whose novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, galvanized the movement with a um, he was the wife of Bowdoin Professor. Let's look at her life a little bit. At age 27, in a letter to her close cousin Pamela Furbish of Wells, Maine, Kate reveals herself in a curious blend of Victorian convention and unrelenting personal quest that lifted her outside her somewhat restricted family and personal, personal community circles. In this letter, she expresses a strong liking for a male cousin, Oliver. Quote, 
I wish I could see him every day for a year so that I might learn him thoroughly and have thought that when I was with him that I'd give more for his honest opinion of me than for any other man I ever met. In the letter, she then apologizes for having said too much. I mean, after all, it was Victorian times. And then she also had a very deeply religious outlook and concern for the situation of her soul. She writes in the letter, I am happy in the thought, dear Pamela, that I am opening a correspondence with a professing Christian, for we shall never be drained for matter to fill a friendly sheet. Now, Kate found herself very comfortable with Episcopalians, although she grew up as a Congregationalist. Today is Sunday, she wrote, I have been in church all day after having been away for the church eight Sundays. If pure liturgy is good for me, I can assure you that I'm a great admirer of its service. I was, it was a happy day to my soul when I find myself within its pole. In another letter, she expresses the view of Christian life as a steady progression, which gave her confidence. The Civil War seemed to have greatly affected the outlook of the Furbishes, and a journal entry by her, her brother John bristles with both patriotism and pessimism. Quote, war, war, civil war. A shudder passes over us when we think of such a thing, but it has already begun. Nothing is talked about but our national trouble. Now, Kate takes up the cause like many women of her time and involves herself in making bandages. However, she didn't feel she was strong enough to go on a trip and help out in any of the hospitals. Kate um, expresses an interest at that time in a man named Wilson, who came to Brunswick to teach and was an acquaintance of her cousin Oliver, to, and whom she met on the street and was attracted to. She expressed a concern about Wilson's going away without seeing her. Quote, there is no excuse for him, for he went to other places. I know one thing, though he was quite pleasant, his company was not essential to my happiness. Now, after the Civil War, Kate began her habit of travel that was to characterize her life at the, uh, uh, until the onset of old age. She enjoys the city life and being among the furbishes of Boston. Having a delightful winter, asked Cousin Pamela to join her. I am still in love with my relatives. She talks about having serious plans, but suffers from neuralgia, but keeps up good courage. She says she went to Boston not to gossip, but for painting lessons. Maine Flora. Before Furbish began her botanical explorations in Maine, there had been earlier attempts to collect and classify Maine's flora. John Jocelyn visited Maine twice, 1638, 39, 1663, 1671, and he stayed at Black Point, Scarborough. He published two books after his second voyage. Rather interesting titles, I must say. New England's rarest rarities discovered in birds, birds, beasts, fishes, serpents, and plants of the country, 1672, and another one, an account of two voyages to, to New England in 1674. His sketches were a model of botanical observation. And then there were two centuries of silence. Maine remained terra incognita. And then we have John Torrey. In 1818, he gets a degree in medicine, collects plants, and catalogs them, recognizes the limitations of Carl Linnaeus' uh, present system, and develops a new one based on principles of structure and function. Now, Tory is, is joined by a young man by the name of Asa Gray, who later became the dominant figure in American botany. Gray was to pull together all the strands in a furious effort to describe the plant life in the U.S. in the mid-19th century. So Gray contacts Tory, moves in with Tory's family, and absorbs everything he can. And in 1836, precocious Gray publishes the textbook Elements of Botany. He makes collections from many parts of the country, and he and Tory work on an ambitious uh, work a flora of North America. In 1842, 
Asa Gray is appointed Harvard College Professor of Natural History and for four and a half decades holds that position. In 1848, he publishes the Manual of Botany of the Northeast U.S., which was Furbish's main text for her later botanizing. You know, at the time, botanists thought that Maine was just another northeastern state uh, where new varieties were unlikely to be found and hence unworthy of serious botanizing. And, Mar and Maine's varied terrain was neglected. Although Maine may not have the density of flora as do the southern states, it is the junction of two major climate areas, which means that its plant life shows a surprising diversity. For few states show so many kinds of terrain, offshore islands, a sinuous coastline ranging from salt marshes to rugged headlands, sandy plains, dense forests, old fields, cold sphagnum bogs, so Maine lies in a transition zone. Southern flora find their northernmost limit in Maine, while many northern Canadian plants find their southernmost limits. And then next, um, Aaron Young Jr. Uh, considered Maine's pioneering botanist, a graduate of Maine Medical at Bowdoin, had a lifelong interest in botany and began his state surveys in Maine, Flora in 1847, but he didn't accomplish much. Then, not much later, in 1861-62, George Lincoln Goodale, native of Saco, abandoned medicine for botany. Back then, you know, most doctors, if not all of them, had to study botany because they were in charge of gathering herbs and making their own medicine. So there was a very close connection between medicine and botany. So. He, uh, he taught at, uh, uh, Aaron Young taught at uh, Bowdoin and Harvard. He collected plants from many parts of the state, but his most important work was in Arusta Can County, where Kate found her famous plant. And he published a checklist of all known plants in Maine. <clears throat> Aaron Young, uh, excuse me, in a feverish outburst of botanizing, in, the early, in early 1870, Kate Furbish, then 36, still living with her ailing parents in the family home uh, on O'Brien Street. She was a diminutive woman, but no means unprepossessing. Her square shoulders, penetrating gaze, and firm, distinct profile gave her a no-nonsense air the unusual, beautiful, lovely spring of that year had a profound effect on Kate, drawing her outdoors and into the woods, into the sandy meadows, along the riverbanks, where she ransacked for plants in a, with a fervor of a pioneer botanist set loose in an unknown Eden. So records show that in 1870, Kate produced an outpouring of scientific and artistic work unequaled at any time in her life, as if by some miracle, the painter of Maine's flora suddenly appeared at the height of her powers, fully equipped, fully matured. So she wandered through the woods and she found mayflowers, wood anemones, violets, bloodroot, twin flowers. The list goes on and on. Around Brunswick, almost all the habitats of the state were represented and she familiarized herself with most of the state's common plants. As she collected plants, she took a very keen interest on the different stages of development, and she made very careful notes. Sometimes she dissect and analyze their flowering parts, others that she pressed and cataloged with detailed notations and preserved on herbarium sheets. She made meticulous drawings of stems, leaves, roots, and blossoms, and even magnified seeds to portray them accurately on paper. At the moment of a plant's full bloom and purest color, she indicated its subtle tints and shadings by daubing touches of color within penciled outlines in her sketches for a time when she would later prepare finished paintings. Always when she needed a confirmation of a name, or a technical detail. 
She turned to the Manual of Botany of the northern U.S., How Plants Grow, or other incomparable publications by Asa Gray. Now, how did Kate learn botany? And by reading a letter to the wife of Bowdoin Professor's wife for her daughter provides us with a clue how she learned to work. Quote, after an experience of 25 years in the botanical field without any teacher but nature, save the privilege of listening to a few lectures delivered by Professor Goodale to the teachers of Boston, I should give her the fields and the juvenile books which treat of the subject in a pleasing way. I am very fond of Gray's How Plants Grow. I have never outgrown it. When Kate set out um, for the nearby woods in April 1870, she was well prepared for whatever plant she would encounter. Gray would become her companion in discovery, and the authority of his word was the foundation upon which she would build her collection. Now, one of the most unique and important aspects of her observation of plants and her knowledge of plants concern the setting, the ecological, ecological niche, niche of a plant. She discovered how plants are linked to time and place. That is their ecological setting, rock strata, soil, moisture, and slope. Quote, rich woodland soils, dry rocky places, well-drained soils and open areas, the muck soils of low wet spots, the banks of rushing streams, stands of hardwood trees, dim carnivorous groves where light rarely penetrated, all yielded their own types of plants to her inquiring eyes. Now, the next major event in her life was in 1873. In early 1873, both parents died within a month of each other. On May 19th at 7.30, I left the home of my life, she said. It was a wrenching departure. 38 and suddenly orphan, left family home adrift and pursuing an uncertain future. Her brothers had a host of opportunities for careers, but as a woman of her times, she was largely limited to teaching, nursing, or marriage. Where so many young men had died during Civil War and so many had succumbed to the rich allure of the opening West, her extended family provided her with much comfort and she went on a prolonged visit to her mother's youngest brother's place in Newcastle, Delaware, then a memorial three weeks in Washington, D.C., which visit shows the remarkable range of her interests. Then she buys a house in Brunswick, and that, we could say, is the coming of age, a haven amidst constant travel. In early 1875, she paid 2800 for a modest white frame house from her brother John, noted for the sunny second-story chamber where she kept her bed and her easel. It was to be the place of her work, a repository for thousands of the pressed plants she obtained throughout the state and a temporary storage place for her already considerable body of botanical watercolors, a haven for her amidst her almost constant travel. So this is showing how she collected her plants and with a plant press preserved them. And this is a picture of Kate Furbish in her studio. She's, she can see the, to the right, the easel holding the, the herbarium specimen and then her, her uh, painting that she's right in front of. Now, a, a very important event in her life was meeting George Davenport and they became fast friends and professionals. He was a fellow botanist. When she was in Boston, she meets her friend, Ann Jackson, not only a friend, but a corrector, collector of wild plants. Uh, and Jackson introduced her, Kate, to George Edward Davenport, who became her long-distance mentor and advisor. They were two experts, respectful of each other's accomplishments, exchanging information and specimens, and talking over the knotty problems of their particular science. 
From an old Boston family and a year older than Kate, Davenport's interest lay in natural science, especially the study of ferns. He became an authority on the subject, founding member of the New England Botanical Society. So she, after taking a trip, uh, she returns home in 1876 and maps out a campaign to, to a master to explore the all of the main flora. She was a purposeful, independent woman. She would survey the state county by county like a military tactician, mount an assault on each, in each one. Around this time, she had decided to include trees among her interests and mainly illustrated them in black and white. But for all the advantages of independence, Kate was still prey to the insecurity and anxiety of a woman working in comparative isolation. After all, this was just after the Civil War. Quote, I should get discouraged sometime if there was no Mr. Davenport or Miss Ann Jackson. She wrote to Davenport. She constantly also referred to her uncertain health. And we're not exactly sure how, what to make of this. Quote, no, my health is not better only as I rest. She wrote Davenport in June 1876. Quote, I'm not working hard, but I can neither study or write or read just as little as I can. And again, she said, I hope you do not think I have forgotten you altogether, for I have not. And my sick head is one excuse. Once earlier in her life, she spoke of neuralgia. So we really don't know. But she was able to carry on and amazingly traveled under very adverse circumstances. One of the th um, challenges that she encountered was other botanists, especially most of them were men. Davenport, who published regularly and who was the center of the botanical activity, often put Kate in touch with other botanists to assist her with various technical issues she encountered. Sadly, these communications reveal that she, as a woman, seems not to have always been respected, partly because of her status as an amateur, but also, she said, as a woman, quote, she wrote to a botanist that Davenport had re recommended and said this, quote, I think he is one of those men who, if I was young and the bloom was on the peach, would feel more interested in helping me. Sadly, yes. Davenport, however, treated her as a scientific colleague and he was and when he was depressed, she offered him solace. Now, the high point, or certainly one of the high points, was the discovery of her plant, which his name eventually was named after her, 1880. Um, a note from the botanist Asa Gray in 1877 showed that Kate, the amateur scientist, had come to notice uh, of the dominant that she, that she was come to the notice of dominant botanists and was qualified to make a significant contribution on her own. George Goodale's report of the survey had carried out in Arista County painted an alluring picture of a sparsely settled and largely unexplored landscape. After the boundary disputes with Canada were settled in the 1830s, the region became the largest county in Maine. There were the St. John's and Allagash rivers that flowed through regions with underlying slate and sandstone. And farther south to the west, there were the soils that made growing potatoes productive. With her main floor in mind, Kate was understandably excited about traveling to the Aroostook as a pioneering botanist who might add new species to the state list. In 1880, after vigorous botanizing in several southern counties, she set out for Orono, considered as the gateway to the Aroostook. Taking the train to Matawamkeg, she transferred to stagecoach on to Fort Fairfield. Braving hip deep muck and mosquitoes, she explored bogs, where she knew she would find orchids, sundews, and pitcher plants that attract most botanists. I first turned my attention to the swamps, she said, which are not hard to find. And she said this in, later in describing her trip. 
it is much more difficult to make one's way in these interminable bogs with a comfortable assurance of ever getting out. The stories about men who had gone into these swamps and never seen afterwards would deter the timid from making the venture. But I found no skeletons, had no misgivings, and always enjoyed surmounting every obstacle which presented itself. Here we find the intrepid explorer, undaunted, often traveling alone. So she explored the banks of the Aristook, and from there she saw the jo St. John's River for the first time. It is one of Maine's grandest waterways, sweeping in a long arc across the northern part of the state, receiving the lively waters of the Allagash at the town of that name, and forming the boundary between the U.S. and Canada. Upon her arrival in Van Buren in August, Kate Furbish went right to these riverbanks, growing in um, tiny crevices where plants that Kate had found elsewhere in Aroostook but were nevertheless still quite interesting to her. She clambered over banks, rising steeply from the river among green alders where much of the soil was dampened by water trickling down from the meadows above. Near the alders, she noticed a small stand of plants with dull yellow corollas and fern-like leaves. A casual botanizer might have passed them by as the common lousewort Pedicularis canadensis, a plant familiar in most of the eastern U.S. When Kate bent down to examine the plants, she realized that they were a kind that she had never seen before. She collected several of them, roots and all, and put them in her vasculum, or collecting case, for further study. It seems that she guessed that she had found a plan, found a plant new to science. This plant had been found nowhere in the world except along a 130 mile stretch of the St. Johns River from Andover, New Brunswick to a point just upstream from its confluence with the Big Black River. This, this plant's special needs for growth are only partly understood, but its environment never varies appreciably from the site in Van Buren where Kate Furbish discovered the original stand. It grows on north-facing slopes, often shaded by spruces, growing on high land above and partly obscured, though not overwhelmed by the alders. Now somehow we find that this plant with its peculiar characteristics and the botanist herself are uncannily linked. It seems a poetic justice that a woman who had laboriously built her idiosyncratic life from family loyalty and a few and few scientific possibilities available to her was the discoverer of a plant that had evolved a most idiosyncratic life of its own, unimposing in appearance, thriving only in a very special habitat and likely to be overlooked. This lousewort resembled the botanist who found it. But in 1880, the discovery of the lousewort was a single incident in a great adventure. She pushed on to Fort Kent and continued to make many uh, findings not necessarily unique to the plant world, but to herself. Uh, she uh, loved uh, Fort Kent, which was rich in flowers and very hospitable people. People called her the Posy Lady, as they had called George Goodale, the Posy Man, 20 years earlier. At that time, she began for the first time to write articles for publications such as the American Naturalist. And she was able to read uh, wider audiences. Now, the supremely creative act of naming a plant. Kate painted the louse work, sent a specimen to the herbarium at Harvard for an official description, and then saw to it that her interest in the matter was not forgotten, brought to the attention of appropriate experts. Also, she wrote a letter to a dear friend and colleague, George Davenport, uh, and ended it with, well, yeah, quote, um, if original, 
Couldn't it be named for its finder? Davenport was in touch with Sereno Watson at the herbarium and recommended that it be named for Furbish. Initially, he had given it, uh, Serena Watson had given the name Perdicularis Joanensis after St. John's River for location, but with Davenport's encouragement, he, he changed it to Perdicularis Furbiaceae, pointing out the great work that she as an amateur had done throughout the state over the past decades. Another a footnote on this, and she did much more exploring and botanizing and, and painting. But later on, this plant, the Furbish lousewort, was able to stop a major proposal to build a hydroelectric dam on the St. John's River. Um, it was the Dickey Lincoln School Dam, a $227 million hydroelectric project. It was proposed in 1974 deauthorized by Congress in 1986 after years of study because the dam would have flooded 88,000 acres of Maine forest and severely reduced the lousewort's habitat. Now, Time magazine called the idea downright silly in 1977. But while thought extinct at the time the dam was proposed, it was rediscovered in 1976. While C.D. Richards was doing survey work. So, Kate Furbish was a prolific botanist. She was an amateur botanist. She traveled around the states in a time when it was very dangerous and brave to, for a, a woman to travel by herself. She accomplished a great deal as an a amateur botanist. And we remember as one of the three women of Maine of our talk today. This is a uh, heart-leaved aster, which was the second uh, unique plant that she found. It was actually a variation of another plant. And these are a few uh, uh, photographs of her paintings, which show the incredible detail that she put in the amount of work and her, her uh, ability to observe and, and render of the lifelike but beautiful uh, observations. And she lived to be almost 100 years old. This is a, a picture of her uh, at the back steps of her Brunswick home. Another lovely uh, painting, the pitcher plant. I was on a bicycle trip with my wife in Brunswick. It was the Bicycle Coalition of Maine or something. And this botanist who was showing us all the trees uh, around the, and he was the, I guess the, you know, he was in charge of taking care of the, all the trees and plants on the campus. He showed us the cemetery where Kate Furbish was buried. Uh, just off the campus and mentioned her name and some of her accomplishments and I was very much intrigued and have never heard of her and it actually took quite a lot of research to to find some sources there was one book that I had to order from a, a, some main library and eventually I went to um, the um, York County Community College that has one of her books or the book that has all, um, all of her, uh, all of her painting. There are 1,330 some uh, of her paintings, and that those books cost, I think, like uh, $350 for a set. The set weighs 35 pounds. So I went there and I looked at those, and so these pictures that I'm showing were actually taken from that collection. So there are not a lot of people, but there, there are a few magazine articles and then a, a book, uh, kind of a, a biography. Our next woman of Maine is Margaret Chase Smith. Born December 14th, 1897, died May 29th, 1995, 98 years old. As you know, 
a United States politician, member of the Republican Party. She served as a U.S. representative from 1940 to 49, a U.S. senator, 49 to 73, from Maine. The first woman to serve in both houses of the United States Congress and the first woman to represent Maine in either. A moderate Republican, she was among the first to criticize the tactics of McCarthyism in her 1950 speech, Declaration of Conscience. She, Smith was a candidate for the Republican nomination in the 1964 presidential election, the first woman to be no, placed in nomination for the presidency at a major party's convention. Upon leaving office, she was the longest serving female senator in history, a distinction that was not surpassed until January 5th, 2011, when Senator Barbara Mikulski was sworn in for a fifth term. To date, Smith is ranked as the longest serving Republican woman in the Senate. Margaret Chase was born in Skowhegan in central Maine to George Emery and Carrie Matilda Chase. Uh, she did well in high school. She was captain of the women's basketball team, but she never went to college. But she became very involved in business and in leadership in business. And she co-founded the Skowhegan chapter of Business and Professional Women's Club in 1922. Uh, from 26 to 28, she was president of the statewide organization, the Maine Federation of Business and Professional Women's Clubs. She worked at local mills. On May 14, 1930, Chase married Clyde Smith, 21 years her senior. He had been after her for years for marriage, but she had studiously avoided that, but she finally gave in. She soon became active in politics and was elected to the Maine Republican State Committee where she served from 1930 to 36. After her husband Clyde was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives to represent Maine's 2nd con Congressional District in 36, Smith accompanied her husband to Washington, D.C. to serve as his secretary. In this position, she managed his, his office, handled his correspondence, conducted research, and helped him write speeches. She also served as treasurer to the Congressional Club a group composed of wives of con congressmen and cabinet members. Then, in the spring of 1940, Clyde Smith fell seriously ill after suffering a heart attack and asked his wife to run for his house seat in the general election the following September. And he said in a prepared press release, quote, I know of no one else who has the full knowledge of my ideas and plans or is as well qualified as she is to carry on these ideas and my unfinished work for my district. And then Clyde died on April 8th of that year, and a special election was scheduled for the following June 3rd to complete his unexpired term. Facing no Democratic challenger, Smith won the special election and became the first woman elected to Congress from Maine. Three months after the special election, she was elected to a full two-year term in the House in her own right. She defeated Edward Beauchamp, the Democratic mayor of Lewiston, by a margin of 65 to 35 percent. And she was re-elected to three more terms over the course of the next eight years, never receiving less than 60 percent of the vote. She also earned a reputation as a moderate Republican who never, who often, excuse me, broke ranks with her party. She supported much of Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal legislation, as had her husband while he was in office. She voted in favor of the Selective Service Act and voted against the Smith-Connolly Act in 1943. In 1945, she voted against making the Un-American Activities Committee a permanent body. Now, at the time, McCarthyism was rearing its ugly head. Uh, there was an enormous fear in the country about the pos possibility that communism somehow would infiltrate the ranks of the august uh, body or in other areas of government. Um, Smith was sworn, sworn into the Senate January 3rd, 
1949. After a year in office, she gained national attention when she became the first member of Congress to condemn the anti-communism witch hunt led by her fellow Republican Senator Joseph McCarthy of Wisconsin. Now, Smith was initially impressed by McCarthy's accusations of communists working in the State Department, but became disillusioned after McCarthy failed to provide any evidence to validate his charges. At first, Smith thought she might be wrong about McCarthy's evidence. I'm not a lawyer, if you remember thinking. After all, Joe was a lawyer, and any s lawyer senator will tell you that lawyer senators are superior to non-lawyer senators. She thought, surely one of the Democrats would take the Senate floor. But when no challenge came, it became evident that Joe had the Senate paralyzed with fear. This sounds a bit reminiscent of modern times, does it not? On June 1st, 1950, Smith delivered a 15-minute speech on the Senate floor known as the Declaration of Conscience, in which she refused to name McCarthy directly but denounced, quote, the reckless abandon in which unproved charges had been hurled from this side of the aisle. She said McCarthyism had debased the Senate to the level of a forum of hate and character assassination. She defended every American's right to criticize, right to hold unpopular beliefs, right to protest, the right of independent thought. While acknowledging her desire for Republican political success, she said, I don't want to see the Republican Party ride to political victory on the four horsemen of calumny, fear, ignorance, bigotry, and smear. Six other moderate Senate Republicans signed on to her declaration. <clears throat> this is the speech, and this is a congressional portrait. Smith later observed, if I am to be remembered in history, it will not be because of legislative accomplishments, but for an act I took as a legislator in the U.S. Senate when on June 1st, 1950, I spoke in condemnation of McCarthyism when the junior senator from Wisconsin had the Senate paralyzed with fear that he would purge any senator who disagreed with him. She voted for McCarthy's censure in 1954. Well, welcome to our third woman of Maine, Rachel Carson, sometimes called the gentle subversive, 1907 and 1964. You know, Rachel Carson was a modern day naturalist who produced one of the most important books of the 20th century. When it appeared in 1962, Silent Spring sounded an alarm that still rings today of an impending crisis brought about the indiscriminate use of pesticides. What began as a well-intentioned effort to rid the environment of insects that destroyed crops and spread disease ended by threatening to poison the planet. To sound such an alarm in the mid 20th century was to subvert a powerful paradigm, one that promised better living through chemistry and encouraged hubris, excessive pride towards the natural world. It was also to storm the male-dominated bastions of business and science who promoted these claims. Carson mounted her assault by relying on her training as a scientist and a popular writer. And it was this creative combination of being an excellent writer, being very sensitive herself to nature, and her training in, in biology that allowed her to write the books and to have the impact that she had. By way of introduction, in 1936, uh, Rachel Carson accepted a full-time position with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, mostly editing and rewriting field reports for scientists who were out in the field, uh, all of them predictably male, but in the evenings, she was managing to keep up with her own writing, working on weekends and evenings when she got home from her job, often pushing deep into the night. At the time, she was the sole support 
for an ailing mother and her two nieces. They were struggling financially amidst the depression. It was a grueling schedule, but her perseverance was paying off. She was chipping away at a writing project that she hoped would change their circumstances about a book about the life of the sea. For her two-week vacation, she drove to a small seaside town of Beaufort, North Carolina, at the southern end of the Outer Banks. And it was her experiences of roaming around, taking careful notes and observations and becoming very inspired. This seems to be a turning point. Every day she took a boat across the busy channel to an uninhabited barrier island where she would spend the day wandering the shores, carefully observing the marine life and contemplating the interconnectedness of the life she observed. Alone on the beach, with only the sea and sky and the long white ribbon of sand unfurling in either direction, time fell away. She watched the surges and the fall of the tides, the shorebirds patter across the wet sand, the puffs of blown sea froth roiling like thistle down along the strand. She stood at the ocean's edge and listened to the waves, smelled the salt air, waded into the tide pools, studying the tiny sea creatures, observed crab holes in the sand. With her notebook, she would record her careful observations scribble out bits of broken narrative, ideas, and sensory impressions. Her initial idea of a book that was essentially a guide to the life on the shore was, was becoming formed from these impressions. Um, it was essentially a guide to the life, uh, and it was becoming something grander, a view of the sea that was more expansive and more viscerally charged. The book she now saw it needed to dramatize the fragile web of connections that bound each sea creature to its particular home as well as among the brutal pecking order. She knew in her bones that no single marine organism or its habitat could be understood in isolation. All were part of a greater interconnected system. Every living organism, no matter how small or large, belonged to a larger diverse, interconnected community. Carson's view was not yet widely understood or accepted among scientists. In fact, the field of ecology was not even invented yet. Plants and animals were largely seen in isolation. The world was broken down into parts. Carson, by contrast, was focused on the connections, the links and interactions that sustained the entire web. Carson essentially began the modern environmental movement by popularizing the basic principles of ecology, becoming one of the most widely read nature writers of her day. She wrote three of the best-selling nature books of her time, including The Sea Around Us and By the Edge of the Sea, and a stunning history-changing book, Silent Spring, that would shatter the paradigm of her time that relied unquestionably on modern science and technology to solve all the problems of the time. Her life. Rachel Carson was born in 1907 on a family farm near Springdale, Pennsylvania, just up the Allegheny River from Pittsburgh. She was a daughter of Maria Fraser McLean and Robert Warden Carson, an insurance salesman. She spent a lot of time wandering among the 65 acres of that farm. And she was an avid reader she began writing stories, often involving animals, at age eight and had her first story published at age 10. At Pennsylvania College for Women, now now at Chatham University, uh, as in high school, she was somewhat of a loner. She originally studied English, but switched her major to biology in January 1928, although she continued writing. Although admitted to graduate standing at John Hopkins University in 1928, she was forced to remain at the Pennsylvania College for Women for her senior year due to financial difficulties. She graduated magna cum laude in 1929. After a summer course at the Marine Biological Laboratory, she continued her studies in zoology and genetics at John Hopkins, but she never did finish her graduate work. 
ended with a master's, a master's in zoology in June 1932. Um, she was forced to leave John Hopkins to search for a full-time teaching position to help support her family during the Great Depression. In 1935, her father died suddenly, worsening their already critical financial situation and leaving Carson to care for an aging mother. At the urging of her undergraduate biology mentor, Mary Scott Skinker, she settled for a temporary position with the U.S. Bureau of Fisheries and writing radio copy and learning a great deal about writing and publicity. Her first book, Under the Sea Wind, was published in 1941 to critical acclaim. But unfortunately, this, less than a month later, on December 7th, Pearl Harbor happened and the world attention was turned around. Her publisher said, quote, the world received it with superb indifference. Barely 2,000 copies were sold. But she rose when within what became the Fish and Wildlife Service and by 1945 was supervising a small writing staff and in 1949 became chief editor of publications. So this position provided her with increasing opportunities for field work and freedom in choosing her writing projects, although she also had tedious administrative responsibilities. By 1948, Carson was working on material for a second book and had made the conscious decision to begin to transition to writing full time. That year, she took on a literary agent, Marie Rodell, and they formed a close professional association that would last her life. Oxford University Press expressed interest in Carson's book, Proposal for a Life History of the Ocean, spurred her to complete by early 1950 the manuscript manuscript of what would become The Sea Around Us. Beautiful book. Chapters appeared in Science Digest and the Yale Review. The latter chapter, The Birth of an Island, winning the American Association for the Advancement of Science's George Westinghouse Science Writing Prize. Excuse me for that. And also, The Sea Around Us won her a U.S. National Book Award, the John Burroughs Medal, recognition as a gifted writer, and uh, financial security. So many people know Rachel Carson for uh, her, her book, which really changed, uh, in a sense, changed the world. But she did, she became a very well-known nature writer before she finally wrote Silent Spring. So in 1952, Carson was able to give up her job and concentrate on writing full time. She had a number of projects and she eventually turned to conservation. She considered an environment theme book project tentatively titled Remembrance of the Earth and became involved with the Nature Conservancy and other conservation groups. Early in 1957, tragedy sadly struck a third time when one of the nieces she had cared for in the 1940s died at the age of 31 leaving a five-year-old orphan son, Roger Christie. Carson, being the compassionate, caring person that she was, she took on that responsibility, adopting the boy alongside of caring for her aging mother. This took a considerable toll on Carson. She moved to Silver Spring, Maryland to care for Roger, and much of 1957 was spent putting their new living situation in order. By late 1957, Carson was closely following federal proposals for widespread pesticide spraying. The USDA planned to eradicate fire ants and other spraying programs involving chlorinated hydrocarbons and organophosphates were on the rise. For the rest of her life, Carson's main professional focus would be on the dangers of pesticide overuse. Now, she was literally drawn into uh, the book, Silent Spring. In the summer of 1957, a woman by the name of Olga Huckins looked on helplessly as a federal crop duster flew overhead, dousing her Duxbury, Massachusetts property with a rain of DDT mixed with fuel oil. 
The aerial spraying that went on intermittently all summer was part of a massive government three-state campaign to, to rid the Northeast of mosquitoes, tent caterpillars, and gypsy moths. The first time it occurred, she watched as the supposedly harmless shower of poison killed seven songbirds in her yard overnight. By the next morning, there were three more corpses at her back door and others scattered around her bird bath. She saw a robin drop suddenly from a, rant, from a branch. She noticed the agony of the birds as they died. <clears throat> Yet all summer, she observed, the mosquitoes were more voracious than ever, while grasshoppers and bees and other harmless insects were not to be found. In January, she sent an angry letter to the Boston Herald and, um, and she sent a copy to Rachel Carson. This letter was perfectly directed to Carson. Rachel had never stopped thinking about the dangers of DDT since she had first heard of it in 1945. And at the same time, Carson heard of a group of Long Island residents who were suing the government over the issue, led by an, an energetic woman named Marjorie Spock. They were suing the government, seeking a permanent halt to all DDT spraying on private lands. Spock, as you may know, was the younger sister of the renowned pediatrician and later anti-war activist, Benjamin Spock. She had left, um, um, Spock had left Smith College to study biodynamic gardening and, agricultural pro, uh, and an agricultural program founded by the German philosopher Rudolf Steiner. Marjorie Spock had put in an organic garden to benefit her live-in partner who was a digestive invalid. First, Rachel responded to the plea from Marjorie Spock by writing to her, uh, a writer, E.B. White, with a New Yorker magazine who had shown an interest in DDT. White said he was too busy, but suggested she take it on. Interesting. At the time, Carson was suffering from an existential crisis brought out by the fears of the Cold War and the possibilities of nuclear annihilation. She took on the project, commenting to Paul Brooks at Houghton Mifflin and conferred with William Sean of the New Yorker, who said he wanted to run a two-part series. The focus of the book was to show how pesticides and other related chemicals products affect human uh, health. And as an aside, but very important to Rachel Carson, was the meeting of Dorothy Freeman in the summer of 1953 at Southport Island. And I've taken the liberty, by the way, if you haven't noticed already, of including Rachel Carson as a main woman because she would spend her summers at Southport. So she met Dorothy Freeman and they developed a very strong and important friendship that lasted for the rest of Carson's life. They exchanged letters, over 900 letters. Carson's biographer, Linda Lear, writes that, quote, Carson sorely needed a devoted friend and kindred spirit who would listen to her without advising and accept her wholly, the writer as well as the woman. They had a lot in common, especially their love of nature. As the biographer Mark Hamilton Little writes, Car Carson quite self-consciously decided to write a book calling into question the paradigm of scientific progress that defined post-war American culture. The overriding theme of Silent Spring is the powerful and often adverse effects humans have on the natural world. Carson's main argument is that pesticides have detrimental effects on the environment. They're more properly termed biocides, she argues, because their effects are rarely limited to the target species. DDT is a prime example, but other synthetic pesticides came under scrutiny as well, many of which are subject to bioaccumulation. Carson also accused the chemical industry of intentionally spreading disinformation and public officials of accepting industry claims uncritically. <clears throat> Carson predicted increased consequences in the future, especially as target pests develop pesticide resistance, while weakened ecosystems fall prey to unanticipated 
invasive, invasive species. The book closes with a call for a biotic approach to pest control as an alternative to chemical pesticides. In regard to the pesticide DDT, Parson never actually called for an outright ban. Part of the argument she made in Silent Spring was that even if DDT and other insecticides had no environmental side effects, their indiscriminate overuse was counterproductive because it would create insect resistance to the pesticides, making the pesticides useless in eliminating the tar target insect populations. In Silent Spring, which took her four years to complete, it meticulously described how DDT entered the food chain and accumulated in the fatty tissues of animals, including human beings, and caused cancer and genetic damage. A single application to a, on a crop, she wrote, killed insects for weeks and months, not only the targeted species, insects, but countless more, and remained toxic in the environment even after it was diluted with rainwater. The book's most haunting and famous chapter, A Fable for Tomorrow, depicted a nameless American town where all life, from fish to birds to apple blossoms to human children, had been, quote, silenced by the insidious effects of DDT. Needless to say, the chemical industry reacted to this book. First serialized in The New Yorker in June 1962, the book alarmed readers across America, not surprisingly, brought a howl of indignation from the chemical industry. Quote, if man were to faithfully follow the teachings of Miss Carson, complaining executive of the American Cyanamid Company, we would return to the dark ages and the insects and diseases and vermin would once again inherit the earth. <laughs> Monsanto published and distributed 5,000 copies of a brochure parodying a silent Spring entitled The Desolate Year, relating the devastation and inconvenience of a world where famine, disease, and insects ran amok because chemical pesticides would have been banned. Some of the attacks were more personal, questioning Carson's integrity and even her sanity. But her careful preparation paid off. Anticipating the reaction of the chemical industry, she compiled Silent Spring as would a lawyer's brief with no fewer than 55 pages of notes and a list of experts who read and commented, and also later, many of whom would defend her thesis. Many eminent scientists rose to her defense, and when President John F. Kennedy ordered the President's Science Advisory Committee to examine the, book, the issues the book raised, it, its report thoroughly vindicated both Silent Spring and its author. As a result, DDT came under much closer supervision and was eventually banned. The public debate moved quickly from whether pesticides were dangerous to which ones were dangerous. The most important legacy of Silent Spring, though, was a new public awareness that nature was vulnerable to human intervention. Carson had made a radical proposal that at times technological progress is so fundamentally at odds with natural process, processes that it must be curtailed. The threats Carson had outlined, the contamination of the food chain, cancer, genetic damage, death of entire species was too frightening to ignore. For the first time, the need to regulate industry in order to protect the environment became widely accepted and environmentalists was born. This was a very key development. Now she was well aware of the larger implications of her work. Um, appearing on a CBS documentary about Silent Spring shortly before her death from breast cancer in 1964, she remarked, man's attitude towards nature is today critically important simply because now we have acquired a fateful power to alert, alter, and destroy nature. But man is a part of nature, and his war against nature is inevitably a war against himself. We are challenged, as mankind has never been challenged before, to prove our maturity and our mastery, not of nature, but of ourselves. 
So one of the landmark books of the 20th century Silent Springs message resonates loudly today, even after several decades after its publication. And equally inspiring is the example of Rachel Carson herself against overwhelming difficulties and adversity, but motivated, motivated by her unabashed love of nature. She rose like a gladiator in its defense. This and is a picture of her testifying before a congressional committee. Weakened from breast cancer and her treatment regimen, Carson became will, ill with a respiratory virus in January 1964. Her condition worsened, and in February, doctors found that she had severe an anemia from her radiation treatments, and in March, they discovered that the cancer had reached her liver. She died of a heart attack on April 14, 1964, in her home in Silver Spring, Maryland. It was said that she had a very difficult time to, in coming to hearings, but she was so brave and she was so determined that she would uh, be able to come to these uh, Senate hearings and she even had to wear a, a wig at the time, a very brave, brave woman. And by the way, in Kittery and Wells, uh, there are the preserves, the Rachel Carson's preserve, that are testaments to her importance as a writer and as a defender of the environment. She was definitely a very important part of the initial growth of, of uh, the environmental movement, which in 1970 became the first Earth Day. Thank you so much for listening to our talk, Three Women of Maine, and hope you enjoyed it. And perhaps we'll see you at another talk sometime.